Okay. Our last speaker for this uh, afternoon is uh, Eva Tardosh from uh, Cornell University. Eva uh, received uh, major uh, awards in uh, her field, uh, including the Fulkerson Prize and the Gödel Prize a few years ago. Eva has been uh, sitting with us, Maria and uh, Rahul, in the Abel Committee over the past few years over the past few days, sorry. <laughs> yes, already we wished it was, it lasted longer, you see. Yeah. And uh, it was a pleasure to have somebody with a perspective that could broaden our vision and interests. And uh, today, uh, Eva will talk about the work for which she was awarded the Gödel Prize, Quality of Equilibria and Effect of Learning in Games. Thank you, Cedric. Thank you all for coming, and it's uh, an honor to be associated with the Abel Prize and with Abel, and you know, someone whose work I learned uh, really early. It's not, my mic isn't on. I thought it's on. Okay. Uh, thank you, sorry for the interruption. Uh, so I'm going to, I've been recently, last even 10 years, I've been working in game theory, and I'm going to talk about game theory. The aspect I'm going to start with is just talking about games and equilibrium in games. Um, I didn't realize what Gromov's going to talk about based on his uh, title. Uh, had I known, he talked a lot about learning and in part learning effects. So, so had I, for those of you who have seen his talk, uh, I would have been better off starting with the other end of my title and starting with learning and then coming to game theory, but that's not how the talk is built. So just hold on a bit. I'm going to talk about what game, game theory is, how one thinks about equilibrium in games and what kind of statements um, one can make about equilibrium in games. And in, in fact, that is the work that's, uh, that we got the Girl Prize for. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about newer work that that instead of looking at equilibria, it talks about what happens if people do what exactly Gromov told us that everyone does, trying to learn rather than magically compute an equilibrium. So that's sort of the main uh, outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, what I'm most interested in, either with learning or without learning, is trying to understand which games are um, prone to something horrible, which I guess is usually one thinks of as a tragedy of commons as the horrible thing. Uh, the tragedy of the commons is a nice story about a little village in England where they had a patch of grass where everyone could graze, everyone who lived in the village could uh, put their cows on. And if you think of this as a game series setup, then it's relatively easy to conclude that a uh, tragedy will happen here, and the tragedy is that there will be way too many cats on the grass where, to the point that the grass will essentially all starve. So there's a good patch of grass where some number of cats could live very happily, uh, but um, if selfish interested agents who are only interested in their own cats are allowed to put as many cats as they want, then they're all going to put too many collectively and that leads to a horrible outcome. If you want to model this mathematically, and I didn't do this very formally here, um, you have to say that an owner has a value for a cow. That value is a decreasing function of how many other cows are on the grass. So more people, more cows share the grass, the less the value is. Um, but an owner of a cow is not so interested in value for other owners. They're only interested in the selfish outcome for themselves, that is, the value of their own set of cows. Um, and because of this lack of interest for the common welfare, uh, each of us will put our own cows to the extent that there are too many cows in the grass. So the question is, some games, something bad happens if you let selfishness take over. In other games, nothing really bad happens. Uh, and I guess the particular example that I will both use today and that's sort of maybe the first of these tracking examples where something good happens is traffic routing, which you can either think of traffic as in car traffic or you can think of traffic as, as packets on the internet. And the model I want to use for this is that cars 
have some, you know, they want to go from some point A to some point B, and they get to choose a path on which they want to go. That's true for cars and packets. And that the speed of which you get to this other point uh, depends on how many other people you share uh, the, the road with, same as on the, in the business with the cows. Uh, the more people you have to share the road with, the slower the traffic gets. Um, so I want to start with an example instead of a former mathematical model. And in fact, I'm going to leave it to all of your imagination, hopefully to finish the mathematical model, trying to stay away from formulas for the talk as much as I can. So generally, there's a network, which represented by a graph such as this, with many more nodes. There are travelers. And this particular example, there are 100 travelers. They want to go from A to B. Generally, you should imagine there are many more than 100. And they don't all want to go from the same A to same B. They all have a source and a destination where they want to go. Each edge has a function written on them. And in this example, they explicitly, explicitly written functions of how the traffic uh, influences the speed at which uh, they get across. So this upper edge here is, takes an hour no matter what. And in contrast, this edge here, which is the one I more want to focus on, is the speed at which they get across the edge depends on how many other people are on the path. So x here represents how many cars we have. So if there are x cars on, on the road, then takes x over 100 hours. Yeah, that's the, generally, there are other functions here. You imagine some, uh, there are some functions that actually come on used in, say, civil engineering and traffic routing. I'm going to just assume it's a function. And we'll assume that's a monotone increasing function that is more traffic, more delay. A few of the results assume that it's a continuously monotone increasing function, which are all assumptions that, of course, makes the mathematics cleaner and seems reasonable. So for example, if everyone goes on the upper edge, all well, 100 of them go on this, then x is 100. And the, then the take it, time to take, get across is 100 on one edge, and uh, sorry, one hour on one edge, and another hour on the second, that's two hours. Um, if they split 50-50 on the two paths, then they get across an hour and a half. And so far, I'm just trying to set up the model. And again, I'm going to stop here. In, and not never formally define what a graph is. But imagine there's a larger network, more complicated uh, functions. Uh, that's the kind of problem I'm talking about. Um, to get you a sense of what I'm going, but I, I, uh, the whole talk or the outline, I think it's best to start with what I think is the most striking example of something interesting happening, which is what happens if I take this edge where uh, 100 travelers can very conveniently go across an hour and a half. You can decide whether it's good or bad, and add an extra edge to it. And this is the edge I would like to add. Um, it's a magical edge. It takes zero minutes to get across this edge. And what I want to point out that with this zero minute edge, the system is no longer at a stable condition or equilibrium. That is, without the edge, these 50 travelers, each taking an hour and a half, and there is not much they can do to go faster. They wish the other guys weren't around, but that's not an option. But with this, they can actually do something. And here is the something they can do. They can go in this red pass. Uh, remember, x is now 50. If one more goes, then I guess it's 51, uh, so roughly 50. And if they do take this wiggly pass, that's 50 plus 50. Uh, that's an hour instead of an hour and a half. So the current solution is not at equilibrium. If instead everyone goes on the wiggly pass, um, well, there are two things. First of all, this is at equilibrium. You might think only sh few people should do this, but that's not true. If everyone goes on this pass, that turns out to be an equilibrium. And maybe more dominantly, it's a bad equilibrium. It not takes them two hours instead of an hour and a half. So secretly, they wish they went back to the previous solution not using it that delay was only an hour and a half. To convince those of you who haven't seen this kind of example that it is an equilibrium, you have to just stare at the picture for a second. Um, you might wonder why they don't use the old pass, but it just doesn't help them to. If you're one of these travelers, you could go back using the old pass and sort of take that shortcut. This delay is an hour. That's an hour. It's not helping you. 
It's not hurting either, but it's not helping. If I take the traveler number down to 99, then it's distinctly hurting you. And the same effect happens. And uh, this is, is, is brace paradox? Exactly. This is called brace paradox. And I guess, I don't know if it's paradox or not. If you want to think of it as a paradox, then I guess what you should think about it is that players are optimizing their own flow, and yet somehow the toll isn't optimized. They sort of share the objective function to try to get across. Everyone wants to get across as fast as possible, and yet uh, they didn't. Um, from the perspective of the tragedy of the commons, which I started with, this isn't actually a paradox. In the tragedy of the commons, the same thing happened. Everyone wanted the cast to be healthy and happy, especially my cow. And yet, they weren't healthy and happy because there are too many casts, and the same thing happened here. Everyone wanted the delay to be small, especially their personal de delay. And as a result, uh, delay wasn't actually that good. I guess if you call it paradox, it's because from the point of view of the planner, it is a paradox that sometimes you uh, add some routes and it gets more congestion in the traffic. And it's yeah. uh, sometimes observed in reality, right? Yeah. So that's sort of the story. Like we added the edge and that actually heard. Heard. There are some examples where this observed in reality, it's honestly hard to, uh, hard to actually measure where reality was and whether base paradox was really the cause of this or not. And I guess I can come back to try to answer some realistic questions about this. Uh, but I guess the first thing I want to do is, from my perspective or the perspective of this talk, I want to declare this is so bad after all. And you might think two hours of traveling instead of an hour and a half is bad. But if I go take back to the internet, maybe it's bad. Maybe it's bad. I don't know. But you know, I'm, there we're talking about a second versus a second and a half, or a millisecond versus a millisecond and a half. It's not good, but it's not horrible. Certainly not a tragedy. In a sense, a tragedy, if I work out the maths for the, for the tragedy of the commons, there is an arbitrary factor that it got worse. Here it got worse by 33%. It's not horribly bad. So this is the question I'm going to ask. How much worse does it get? And I'm sure all of you are convinced by just the example that something happened and this is not the optimal solution. And in fact, the previous solution was turned out to be the optimal, not using that zero length edge. Uh, but maybe I want to actually also start by sort of relating to what did these people do wrong, which helps one understand that there isn't really a big, big, big paradox here. So also, after all, this is a maths audience with a maths talk, so I'm going to need some notation. So in thinking about this, I'm going to use the following simple notation. The functions that I call delays on the edges that are just sitting here like naked functions are going to be delay on the edge E. The DE of x is the delay on edge E, and x is the amount of flow. And then the flow on the edge, to remind you of the flow word, is f of E. That's our two names I'm going to use. And then what we had that this equilibrium that I'm talking about, which is uh, technically a game theoretic Nash equilibrium, is every flow in the network travels what's currently the minimum delay pass. Right? The whole idea was that if they're not going on the shortest pass from the source to the sink, then that's not an equilibrium they prefer to switch. So when they all go on the shortest pass, that's the Nash equilibrium. So this is the equilibrium condition. If you think about this from a perspective of um, you know, multivariate or even single variate normal optimization, then this looks very, very similar um, to an uh, optimality condition. It, in fact, every pass they're using is the minimum, minimum the shortest pass, minimum gradient pass. That would be the standard optimization term. Before I write that down, I want to actually rewrite in a natural way of what do I mean of optimum. So in my examples, there was a single source and single sink, and everyone shared the same delay. So optimum is a little easy to write there. It's just the delay these people are sharing. In a more general network, here is an alternate way to write what I'm optimizing. And I claim this is the natural optimum function, the average delay or sum of all the delays. But I wrote it differently than the sort of English version. I wanted to write sum over the all edges, flow times the delay. 
to convince you that this is sort of the same, or it's, in fact, it's mathematically the same, if I take any edge E, there are FE people sitting, or FE cars, or FE packets, whatever, uh, on the edge. And each one of these uh, suffers D of FE delay. So this is the total delay. Some not over people, but summed over the edges. Nonetheless, it's the same sum. If I look at it this way, then I can easily write down what would be the optimality condition. And it's something very similar. Every piece of flow or every should travel on what's the minimum gradient pass. And what's the minimum gradient pass? Every edge, I should take the derivative of that expression there. So I did uh, using uh, product rule. And what I got is two terms. One of them is exactly what we're minimizing, the selfish part. Everyone optimizes to optimize day delay, and that's indeed in the gradient function. But here is another term that should show up in the gradient, and that's what I call the altruistic term. In the gradient, there is this term that says, person A should be worried about how much pain he's causing to the other guys. So if he takes this edge, then f of e people who are already sitting on the edge will have day delay increase at the rate of the derivative. That's the altruistic part. That's when he took into account that by doing something, he's causing damage to social welfare. And what the selfish people do is ignoring the, altru the, the altruistic part. And obviously, they're optimizing the wrong function. So clearly, then, they're optimizing the wrong function. They're not getting the optimal solution. But you can also say that they're optimizing something similar. What they're optimizing is not that different from this. It's just sort of not quite the right thing. And so some functions will turn out to be the case that this is an important enough term in this optimization that by optimizing that, we're sort of OK, or we're not far from OK. And other functions, as we saw for the tragedy of the commons, it's very, very far. And you get this, the dominant term is this. And then you're in trouble. So this is a high level sort of distinction that some games work well and some other games do not. Uh, so, so, so yeah. Uh, uh, somehow I'm, I, I'm lost in the formalism, but when you say travels along minimum gradient path, here you define a path. How? In which space? It, I guess this is a discrete path. paths. So in, in, in both cases, so this is using the sort of flow or graph theory st standard notion of, of what a flow is. A flow is a way to get traffic from A to B or a way to get traffic from sources to things. It doesn't have to be single source, single thing. Um, so you say the, the gradient is respect to uh, I mean, the uh, uh, function being... Right. So this is actually a great question. Let me stop you for a second. So when I take shortest pass, you naturally took it that I'm going to just add up the delays on the edges. Like you s suffer some delay on first edge and some delay on the second edge and some delay on third edge, and I just edit it up. Now, if I want to optimize some global objective function, I should take the gradient. It's a multidimensional thing. Um, I try to translate it for you. And trust me, what comes out is the following. Uh, you're still obliged to send your flow from source to sink. That's a constraint of the optimization. You're in the subspace on which everyone goes from source to sink. That's a, a linear constraint. Uh, you're in the subspace. So I can translate the standard gradient optimization to mean the following. Uh, yes, you will choose pass from source to sink, because you have to. You, your solution lies in that subspace. But within that subspace, you should choose to optimize the gra gradient. And what's the gradient is that in every edge, edge by edge, I took the derivative and, and summed them up the very same way I'm summing up the delays here. And this, this falls out pretty standardly, like without too much hassle on multidimensional optimization, which I skipped over, but maybe uh, for, you know, uh, for those of us very used to graph theory, maybe this, this happens naturally, but it would have been maybe good to thank you for asking the question. So the number of dimensions would be the number of edges? Number of dimension here is the number of edges, yes. And my constraints are uh, some, something that describes this flow. So it's something that the, every edge, every node, the amount of flow comes in should equal the number of flow at except for the sources and things, where should equal this number I wrote on the slide, like how many people would like to terminate there. So I have this very simple linear so-called flow conservation constraints 
which forces me in the subspace on which people travel to the right, between the right pair of six. In that subspace, the optimality condition is exactly this. Sum up over edges, everyone needs to travel on what's the minimum gradient path. So edge by edge, I adopt the gradient. Does that make sense? Good. OK, so the main theorem that I'm actually going to prove to you, and we'll prove to you with a surprisingly easy proof, which is not our original proof, I admit, uh, is or sort of proof to you. I sketched the proof. I think it's a more honest word. Is a joint work with Tim Ruffgarden. And uh, it says that if I take this Nash equilibrium flow, arbitrary continuous monotone non decreasing cost. So the assumptions on the cost function or this delay function is exactly the natural condition I just promised to you. The cost is monotone increasing on every edge, more traffic is worse, and it does so in a continuous fashion. Uh, I'm, and under these conditions, there is something positive I can say about Nash equilibrium. It's the, co the overall cost of a Nash equilibrium. It's not as good as what I promised. It's not this, this um, two versus one and a half. But it's something positive and very general. What is the positive statement? The positive statement is that if I, instead of comparing the flow to an optimally designed flow, I compare it to an optimally designed flow that happens to carry twice as much traffic. The every sourcing pair, instead of 100 people, I carry 200 people, but you're welcome to plan the traffic. Then the Nash equilibrium is cheaper under arbitrary cost functions than the optimum would have been with double the traffic. So sort of the high level message says that if you're choosing between two actions you can take as a network designer, uh, you know, plan for larger traffic than you're actually going to have, or tell people which way to go, then I guess you should choose to planning for bigger traffic is a better idea. If you're either of the domains, telling people which way to go is just not an option, so I offered you an alternative. So uh, here when you say small users, it means small flows on each edge? Or what? Yeah, there's a second condition here uh, to have this theorem exactly true, and otherwise I have to add some epsilons to it. That when I talk about cars and people, I was talking, and even, even my example back, a few slides back, I said 100 passengers. Mm -hmm. But when I did the maths, I did continuous maths. So when I actually gave you this, the ch cheat already occurred on this slide. When I said that the Nash equilibrium <coughs> means everyone using the shortest pass, that's only true with arbitrarily small passengers. If the passengers are one unit, then when you're switching, you're upping the flow by one unit. If I took the limit and doing continuous maths rather than discrete maths, then this is exactly the condition. Under continuous functions, uh, one extra person is not, I took the limit. It's not increasing the flow. Okay, that's, the, that's, so if you actually want, back to the theorem, if you actually want the theorem on discrete users, you have to have some upper band of how fast the function grow and and based on this upper band, there's some epsilon that shows up in the serum. Uh, certainly looks nicer without the epsilon. And uh, probably in many cases, what is of interest uh, to you is the uh, amount of the uh, loss in the cost. But if there is an assumption about how fast the cost grows in terms of the flow, then uh, you can transform. So if it's sublinear, it becomes like the cost on the left is uh, less than twice. Yeah, that's an excellent point that it's in, in many cases, the traffic is really big, both in packets and in cars, and plus one is, is really noise. So we're in a place where the, the, the speed of growth is very slow, very slow for one additional car. OK. Um, <laughs> So I promised you that there's this extra title, uh, word in my title, and that's what I'm going to uh, switch to before I give you any maths on proving anything or why something might be true. Uh, and that's sort of the newer part of the work, and that's something I definitely want to emphasize, is uh, what selfish outcome, that is, looking at learning instead of Nash equilibrium. And I remember, especially because of Gromov spending an art, or much of his art talking about learning, I was already admitting that that's part of the emphasis of this talk. So classically, when you look at the game theory, the stable outcome, or Nash equilibrium, is the standard 
thing that people study. So to be uh, formal defining Nash equilibrium in a game is a, a set of strategies that everyone does where the current behavior is best response. So again, flipping back to the example slide, this is a Nash equilibrium because all 100 users they can't help themselves. There's nothing they can do. They're currently doing the best for themselves in the current solution, whereas uh, going back this way, it's not an Nash equilibrium because, as it turns out, every single one of the 100 users can help themselves and find a better solution. So Nash equilibrium is a solution where no single user can single-handedly improve his own solution for himself. Um, this is a standard notion in, you studied both in game theory as a field and actually economics as a much bigger field. Uh, it, it been the classical standard notion, I guess taught in Econ 101 classes as the basic solution concept. And I think similarly in Econ 101 classes, people already start talking about what's wrong with it. But let me actually say what's right with it. So the first part that in the talk when I talked about Stable outcome, I meant Nash equilibrium. When I showed you the theorem with Tim Ruffgarden, that was about Nash equilibrium. It said every Nash equilibrium has a reasonably low cost. And in fact, there is this term that uh, uh, coined by Christos Papadimitriou, price of energy, which wants to measure how much worse a Nash equilibrium is compared to a centrally designed outcome. A cost, worst possible cost of equilibrium compared to some socially optimum design cost. And our original paper with Tim was studying exactly this. How bad is this ratio? Uh, but somehow, Nash equilibrium is a bit questionable. And over, um, I, I admit, even when I first gave talks about this result, uh, any economist in the audience instantly asked me, why do you like Nash equilibria? But in the meantime, the more mathematical, mathematics, computer science community also woke up to the fact that we shouldn't like Nash equilibrium. And here is why. Uh, Nash equilibria tends not to be unique. If you're a player in the game, you have to magically in your head compute a Nash equilibrium and know what to do. And what's worse, you have to choose which one. If there are multiple Nash equilibria, then magically, apparently without talking to the other players, as car drivers tend not to talk to each other, uh, have to know that, no, no, I'm doing the Nash equilibrium in which I'm supposed to drive that way. How on earth did you know that? Magic hand of the Magic hand, the magic hand of capitalism. And even when the Nash equilibrium is unique, how on earth did people find this? How did they do this computation in their hand? In, in their head? Um, if you're a mathematician, uh, maybe you should be worried that there is a complexity problem here. So that's Kalakis, Goldberg, and Papa Dimitriou, and this is more recent, uh, proved that computing an Nash equilibrium is computationally hard. Now, ideally, you would have preferred that I write NP-hard here, because maybe everyone knows what NP-hard is. And unfortunately, it's not known to be NP-hard, and probably it's not NP-hard. It's hard for another class called PPAD, PPAD, which I will not define. It's something like, something like NP. What's wrong with NP, that the NP-hard questions are usually yes, no questions. So you're asking things like, you know, is there a Hamiltonian cycle in this graph? That's NP-hard. Um, I don't know an, a yes, no question to which I don't know the answer. Does this graph have a Nash equilibrium? Yes, it does. Nash proved it. So there is no yes, no question I know that, that is equivalent to what I'm asking. Uh, I just ask you to find a Nash equilibrium. The only yes, no question I can think of, does this graph have a Nash equilibrium? And I know the answer to that, yes. So I can't phrase it in the classical NP category. If I rephrase it, find a good cost Nash equilibrium, find a bad cost Nash equilibrium, find a Nash equilibrium in which I have to take that pass, uh, those are all NP complete. But those are not quite the right question, which is why it's PPAD instead. The, the natural question, does this graph have an Nash equilibrium? The answer is yes, every graph has one. But the uh, problem like the uh, packing, uh, uh, optimum, uh, efficient packing problem, thing like this is in terms of computing something also, but in terms of- It's a no term, so yes, but the MP completeness proofs all go into turning them into a yes, no question. 
and then it turns out the yes no question is hard. Even though technically it's a bad computing something, if you go into the proof, every proof is, if you computed this, you could ask the following yes no question and deciding the answer to that yes no question is hard. And there is no yes no question here that is equivalent to the Nash question. I don't, you know, this is an informal explanation of why it is. It's Technically, okay. it's po it would be possible, it, all, all kinds of things are possible. It could be that MP complete problems are solvable. But certainly, this is causing some difficulty here. We can live with this. No? Yeah. yeah. So, this says that there is another problem with Nash. Not only the players can't find it, we can't find it either. So, th even if they coordinated, it, it's still hard. Uh, so, maybe we should think about what do I mean? And I guess I want to propose that there is a natural definition, and that's learning. And I can tell you what learning is. And I guess, unlike in Gromov talks, because I'm going to prove mathematical things about learning, I'm going to define learning. I'm sure if Gromov uh, you know, thinks about this, he will object to my very formal mathematical definition of what I mean by learning. Uh, but this way, I can prove <coughs> theorems about it. Is it, is it uh, lead no Nash or lead to Nash? Ah, two Nash, yeah, there's an awkward typo in the talk, thank you. Uh, does natural behavior lead to, lead to Nash? And no, it does not. We know it exists, but we can't find it this way, as we have seen with the uh, hardness result. Uh, there are many definitions of what could be natural behavior. I want to define learning as my natural behavior. And I don't actually tell you how to learn. I want to tell a property of what do I mean by the fact that you learned in a way that many, many natural algorithms fall into my class, but not all of them. So here is what I'm going to mean by learning. Learning will mean that you have no regret. Um, and I'm going to. Uh, uh, so, I'll define it in a, I, I'll do two things, show you an example and define it in a minute. But before I do so, let me give you the high level pitch of why I think this is the right definition or at least right definition for game theory. Um, it especially will apply to setups such as this traffic routing that happens over and over again where people have the opportunity to learn what to do. It's trying to model uh, 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 an evolving behavior, like you, one day you do this, another day you did that, and you observed. Like, for example, I no longer will need that these delay functions are announced and written on a blackboard and everyone knows what they are. You just go and try. And you see how many minutes it took you on that pass, and then you can try another pass. And you can keep trying till the right thing happens, and that's what I mean by learning. So it's an evolving behavior. Under the evolving behavior, Nash equilibrium would mean that the solution is stable. They find a set of paths, so they every day drive, do the same thing. Um, and if they ever happen to be stable, my definition will coincide with Nash. I'm just not going to make the assumption that they're stable. They can keep experimenting, and it might be good for them. So I take out the stability assumption, but I keep the they, they, they look, they're aiming to find the right solution. Um, and second, there will be many very natural, simple algorithms that achieve this kind of form of learning. And I'll show you uh, one. Um, sec third, uh, learning outcomes, unlike the Nash equilibrium, will form a convex set. So, you know, if you've done convex optimization, you'll instantly say, oh, the solution set is convex, therefore I can find it. Which is almost right, and essentially the intuition is right. Nash equilibria forming discrete points in some weird space. That's a Nash, and that's over a Nash, and in between there is no Nashes. That's part intuitively for those of us who've done a lot of convex optimization. This is why it's hard to find, they're a weird set of points. Um, Convex sets, finding points in convex sets is much better. This is almost right. There is a technical difficulty. This is a convex set in incredibly high dimensional space. Um, so, but nonetheless, it's true uh, that you can find the solution despite the very high dimensional space. Uh, it's a paper of uh, young Leighton Brown, who is sort of a follow up to. Papa Dimitri and Ralph Garden. And the high dimensional space problem here is if I have n players, they each have two strategies. Then the strategy combination of what they can play is 
two, player, two strategies each and players, that's two to the n options. So the convex space I'm talking about is in two to the n dimensional space. So I have to be a little careful how I'm describing that space in my polynomial time. But ignoring that, it's still possible. So it's a convex space. There are good algorithms to find it. These algorithms here are not what I'm talking about when I want to learn. These are centralized algorithms. Do, a, do convex optimizations such as the ellipsoid method and other nasty things, not things that players can do. Here in this, when you say learning, it's the whole bunch of players. No, in, I'll tell you in a minute what I mean by learning. So this is sort of a high level of what, what, what's good about it. Here's what I mean by learning. And hopefully this slide answers your question in an intuitive level. And the next slide will tell you a definition. And then uh, if, if it's not clear enough, come and ask me in a second. So what I mean by learning is every player separately engages in the following activity. They play some strategy in step one, and something happens. And play some strategy in step two, and something happens. And step three and step four, maybe collectively. And the idea is that up front, when they started, they're rather clueless. They don't know what's going on. But as time went on, hopefully, they figured it out. And here is what I mean by no regret. And this is will come twice, once in English and then once in a formula. What I would like to have them achieve, again, I'm defining a property, not an algorithm. So any learning algorithm is good for me if it achieves this property. So I have to do two things. I tell you what the property is. Hopefully convince you that this is a good property or meaningful property. And then I have to give you algorithms that achieve it. I have to convince you that this is actually doable. Uh, so here is the property. If you look at the cost, which I just came with uh, delay, that you incurred over a long time, it should be no worse uh, than any fixed strategy with hindsight. So what does that mean? If there is a pass on which you could drive, which is always fast or most of the time fast, please wake up to this. If you do this 100 days over and over again, and there's a really good driving pass, hopefully we all learn fast enough to figure this out. If it's the case that you know, on some you know, prime number days you should drive on this pass, but on non-prime numbers you should drive on some other pass, that's crazy. Who knows? There might be a good pass all the time, but there is no way to figure out which one is that for today, in the morning when you wake up. But if there is a, a fixed strategy, there is a fixed pass as star, a fixed strategy, it's always good for you. Please notice that this is what, it, what this algorithm asks. Okay, so no regret means if there is a fixed strategy which hindsight has, would have been very good for you, please notice it. Question. This is equivalent to spectrum one players, so you're doing Yeah, each, and I'm, going, and I'm going to assume every player does this. And there are some extensions that, again, I, it's not in the talk, but I'm happy to answer some questions if what happens if almost all players do this instead of all players do this. But for the CRM, every single player achieves this. And again, like the continuous case with the, num with the size of the players, I'm going to take the limit when you literally got no regret. In reality, what I mean to do is have another epsilon in here. Because of course, reaching no regret might be a little tricky. Like on day, if there's a really good pass, who says on day one you knew which one that was? So up front, you made a little mistake. So I need some amount of time till this happens, and I'm going to have to carry a little epsilon. But, but the assumption is that, there are, that you reach, as time went on, everyone, all the players, reached minimal regret for themselves. That is, the amount of regret is very, very small. Remember, this is a pretty weak standard. You can do better than this. It's possible to beat this, because you, you cleverly switch between paths in a good way. Uh, some algorithms do beat it, uh, do better than this. But I claim this is not a bad standard. It does mean something. It carries some of the theorems. And um, it's doable algorithmically. Um, yeah, OK, I'm going to, maybe I, this is a good slide, even though I will have to skip later slides. To convince you that learning is actually a great idea in games, I started with a very, very simple game, or two very, very simple games. One of them is matching pennies. Hopefully, everyone knows what matching pennies is. You either win or lose, and this matrix is trying to describe to you what happens in this if they choose this, uh, this, this person. So this is one, one column is one 
The rows are one person's strategy, the columns are the other guy's strategy, and these are the payoffs for the two players. Minus one for one, one for the other. You used the, the, half, the famous half dollar coin, which is- uh, Yes, I did movie. use that coin. It was a nice coin to take a picture of. So they choose head or play. And here's what no regret tells you. If the opponent plays randomness properly, knows how to randomize, 50-50 probability picks the two things, then what's your standard? You want no regret. Well, it doesn't that much matter what you want, what you're playing. You regret, uh, the best thing you can do is get payoff of zero. That's usually what one thinks of as the solution of this game. And you have regret if your payoff is worse than zero. That is, you keep losing. And indeed, you should feel silly in that case if that happened. But here is something more interesting. If the opponent's playing badly, for whatever reason he favors this column because he's playing badly, now the regret standard went up. He says, if you, you, you should have regret if you're not making at least a half a dollar on average, or half of a coin flip on the average. Right? Because you could do that by simply always picking the top row. That's your regret standard. So what no regret says is that in a way, and this is what the example tried to show, if the opponent's playing well, playing the Nash equilibrium, you too should play the Nash equilibrium. But if opponent is playing badly, please take advantage of him. I think it's a more natural outcome definition for a game than a pure Nash equilibrium, where you just assume everyone is smart. But, uh, not sure understood how it matches the uh, usual uh, uh, notion of regret. In this case, for instance, you say uh, if he plays uh, badly, you should uh, take advantage of this? I mean, what I guess you're not regretting. You should regret not having played the top row all the time because you that would have been bad. The so there is the special strategy as star, the best strategy with hindsight. And if you regret not having done that, that's the thing you should not regret. Does that help? OK, so that's what no regret learning means. I'm going to uh, actually tell you. So again, the choices that people have as strategies. So instead of these coin flips, they're going to choose between paths. And let me tell you the algorithm. It's a very natural algorithm called multiplicative weight, or actually in the financial industry hedge. You're hedging your bets. You start by, according to the algorithm, being utterly clueless and randomly choosing a pass. But so you're maintaining some weights for the pass and choose probabilities. But what you should do is every day you should observe what happened that day and update the probabilities with a natural update function, which basically says that if the cost of a pass was high, you should please weigh down the probability. Don't do it with as pro high probability. And if the weight of the pass was good, then up upgrade the probability. This is a particular cost function here, actually, to use this cost function technically. You have to not only know what your pass delay was, but you have to know everything else to use this formula. Uh, but the basic intuition is the same, and virtually anything you do in this category all works. That is, anything where you have good experience with strategy, do it more often. You have bad experience with the strategy, scale it down a bit. Uh, I use an epsilon, which is a parameter here of how much I'm scaling it down, which controls two things, uh, the speed of learning. That is, I learn very slowly if epsilon is small, and the quality of learning. That is, if you scale something down with the bad experience very fast, then you might have lost something good. So it, there's a trade-off parameter here of how fast you learn. This is one of many natural learning processes, the, the high-level messages. Any kind of function you plug in here that does roughly this all results in no regret. These are all good functions. Um, so I guess I'm going to maybe skip. Uh, I have a few minutes. Maybe it's worth uh, just going continuously. So what does it mean that people do learning in games? And I sort of told you this. They, the, every one of the players plays one of these strategies. They don't have to play the same strategy system. They can do whatever they want, as long as they have all no regret. The outcome is what's called a correlated equilibrium. And this is maybe the last formal definition I wanted to go through. So correlated equilibrium is, a, is an outcome of play where, again, examples do better than anything formal. Uh, and here are my example is the rock, paper, scissor game, which again, hopefully, is famous enough that everyone knows. 
And described in the same way, one player cho choosing from the columns and the other ones choosing from the rows, the other way around, and payoffs in the uh, matrix. To make life interesting, I have a contorted version of rock, paper, scissor that I like better. I put minus nine or some minus big number on the diagonal. So this is rock, paper, scissor, unless the, the two players play the same thing in which they give me nine dollars each or nine euros each. Okay, so it's a bad form of rock, paper, scissor. Your expected payoff at the Nash equilibrium is minus three. The unique Nash is what it used to be. You have to randomize between the three options. Because, say, thinking about Cedric as my opponent here, if he very heavily pays rock, well, uh, paper beats rock, so I'm going to very heavily pay, pay paper and, and beat him all the time. So his only option is to randomize. And if you randomize, then unfortunately, we have a one third chance that we're colliding and we're paying $9 each. So this is not a good game. But you can do learning in it, and learning will do something cool. We'll actually avoid the diagonal if you do learning. And what we're doing, we're getting into a feedback system with each other, where I accidentally, because randomization is not so good usually, like, you know, there's standard big deviation theorems here. If I flip random coins, then accidentally, I will start with maybe too much scissor. And Sedgwick's learning algorithm will say, you know, Eva is doing too much scissor. I guess learning algorithm will tell Sedgwick to do too much uh, rock. But then my learning algorithm will wake up to the fact that Sedgwick's doing too much rock. I should do too much paper. So what we're going to end up doing is cycling around this cycle that you see on the picture. And I guess thinking of a dynamic system, we're cycling around in the strategy space, sort of going around in a cycle. Or thinking about, so first of all, we're not converged. It will never become a Nash because we're not converging. We're going away from the Nash. And instead, we're going to the following probability distribution, which is what I'm going to call a correlated equilibrium. This is the probability distribution at the limit where we really are completely off the diagonal, which will take us ever to reach. But at the limit, we're completely off the diagonal, and we have probability 1 6 in each of the other positions, giving us a payoff of 0, where remember the Nash had a payoff of minus 3. So correlated equilibrium is a different animal. We correlated, what did we do here? We correlated because we both learning from our shared history. And that got us correlated. So we're not actually independent the way we should be in a Nash. But we're doing something like the Nash. It's a very similar definition of a Nash. Uh, I, I, I don't get it. Will it get into a correlation, a correlated yeah. equilibrium? Yes. Okay. So if you do these learning algorithms, you certainly can run simulations, and they do exactly this. Uh, you can try with humans, and they do something similar, actually. Humans are doing it, too. So it's, it's not a bad idea that to model this way what, what, what learning does, this sort of trying to get no regret. Uh, OK, uh, maybe it's a bad, uh, the best outcome for a talk uh, with a broad audience. But I guess I'm going to, there are some slides here that try to give you some more technical details of what we're proving, um, uh, which I'm going to mostly skip. The main uh, theorem, which I unfortunately won't have time to go into details improving, is that that nice theorem I showed you in the beginning, which says that the cost of Nash equilibrium is um, no worse than twice the, the optimal solution that carries twice as much traffic. That's not only true for Nash equilibrium, it's true for this correlated equilibrium. So as long as everyone learned, um, then the same theorem holds, even though they maybe it couldn't find the Nash equilibrium. Um, but I guess it's probably best idea to skip the proof. At the very high level, and this is maybe the only thing I want to tell you about the proof, there is a main technical lemma that carries uh, certainly the easy version of the, the new easy proof of the original CRM and that actually extends to this, is a, a CRM that says roughly seeking and actually ignore the top slide. Uh, read the yellow part, or at least the part I want to emphasize, that no matter what solutions the player ha players have, if that solution is very, very expensive, and I mean so expensive, even more expensive than the optimum that carries twice as much traffic, 
That's my benchmark. That's what I want to compare to. So if, this, if the current solution, Nash or not, is so expensive, then more expensive than the solution would be, the optimal solution with double the traffic, then one of the players, uh, if they switch to the optimal pass in this double solution, they can improve their own solution. This clearly proves that this is an easy, once I prove this theorem, which I won't get into, it clearly proves the Nash statement. If it's a Nash equilibrium, no player can improve their solution, so it couldn't be this expensive. But it turns out there is nothing about Nash here. It is about regret. If no player regrets those two special strategies that the copies of his players in the optimum are playing, then I'm all set. I just need the no regret. I don't need stability of the Nash condition. This, this proof is solely based on the no regret condition. And hence, it applies to learning outcomes, which I carried the no regret condition, getting rid of the independence and stability. So I'm going to stop here, uh, sorry, and not actually give you the proof. Um, at the higher level, um, hopefully, I made some points that are maybe useful to summarize. Um, and there is a tragedy of the common. There are many, many examples like this. Um, in many cases, selfish users can completely ruin social welfare. Uh, sometimes you can design things that are better than that. And at least the kind of guarantee that we can approve about this is actually surprisingly robust, which is part of the new work here. It not only applies at Nash equilibrium, which has issues because, for example, it's hard to find, but it applies to learning outcomes, which is something at least I convinced you or hopefully explained to you what learning outcome is. And actually something I didn't even plan to explain uh, it also applies under uncertainty. There is another issue with any Nash equilibrium definition. Apparently, you had to know how many other cars are driving. That's a tricky thing to know. Uh, a better model here assumes that there is some basic randomness, like a Bayesian-style random model on which the number of driver get, drivers get pulled on, and you're taking expectations, and it applies under that kind of model. Um, learning in, in, in traffic writing is an easy and nice example to show. <coughs> But the same uh, proof strategy and this kind of results now have been developed for many other games, including bandwidth sharing, facility location, and, and recently a bunch of things on auctions. And I'm going to stop here. And thank you for your attention. Sharing precisely is one of the uh, model examples that people give of applications of game theory for this uh, historic case of bandwidth sharing in Australia, maybe, or, or something that happened in some time. Is it that it's a really, uh, I see it now, I see it quoted again in your talk, and I wonder is it that it's really a specific situation in which things work very well, while in other examples it works less well? Yes, uh, yes, exactly. That's, that's why I had it on the slide. I have to be a little careful to define my problem. And I guess I actually have everything in preset to tell you what the <laughs> trade off is. Uh, what's wrong in the tragedy of the commons is that you can put extra cast on the, on the grass. And the same, thing, same wrong thing happens, goes wrong with bandwidth. And unfortunately, that's one of the troubles our society faces. Uh, we can all put in more, more and more bandwidth requests. So mathematical models where users can benefit from getting more and more bandwidth in a sort of very eager kind of way, uh, there is a tragedy. The particular assumption here that makes these models work very well um, is uh, that we have concave increased utility for our bandwidth. That is, as you get twice as much bandwidth, your happiness doesn't go faster than twice as high. That is, your, 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 your happiness or utility for increased bandwidth is a concave function. And that causes the bandwidth, bandwidth sharing to work, work well, that is, have this limited uh, tragedy. Is it obvious why it's concave? I don't, uh... No, it's sometimes not concave. So generally, it's believed that if you use the bandwidth to, to download data, it's concave. It's use the bandwidth to, uh, to, for voice over internet, it's concave. But if you use the bandwidth to watch movies, it's not concave. 
like movies are not watchable on a little bit of bandwidth, uh, a, a file will sooner or later download, download for you and if you have twice as much bandwidth, it will have take half as much time, but you get the file sooner or later, so it's less than double the benefit. Uh, it, it's certainly not true all the time and it's definitely not true for video. Uh, it's just not watchable if you don't have enough bandwidth. So I didn't know, it, under the model that your utility for bandwidth is concave, uh, there are positive results. If your utility for bandwidth is not concave, sorry. Are there other questions around? Yes. How robust are your theorems against malicious users? So is someone trying, having the opposite uh, So this is a great question. Everything I, I had on the slide always assumed that everyone is a, a regret minimizer. That is, they have the objective function I thought they had, minimizing their own delay, rather than having the malicious objective function of maximizing everyone else's delay. Um, results vary. Uh, the, auction, the auction case actually is good for this. Other things are bad for this. And the traffic routing, there are some results that are positive. It's hard, like you have to think about what a user can do, like uh, to make it sort of use, use terms that are standard in, in sort of attacks. Uh, I'm currently doing nothing to prevent a denial of service attack. attack. Mm -hmm. if, if someone puts in an awful lot of traffic just so that we all have slow traffic, my model doesn't prevent this from happening, and indeed, that causes a tragedy uh, for everyone else. In some other models, uh, the players don't have, they, they don't have the ability to, do, to cause such damage. And one can say that, the, that we get as much welfare as the non-malicious non users could, could, or at least a fraction of the welfare, a good fraction of the welfare that the non-malicious users could do by themselves. Uh, it varies, and that's a great question. Sometimes, sometimes I don't know. Like it seems like life is bad, so mathematics is not going to help us. Other questions? Yes. Uh, so I guess that's a that so the question was whether the, I relied that this is a discrete optimization question. They're choosing between a finite set of paths, and you ask whether I can make it infinite. Um, yes and no. Uh, I'm actually already afraid of the finite number of paths some way. Uh, if you remember what I did, and I totally swept this under the rug, I said that people keep choosing randomly between the paths. With exponential number of paths, that's going to be a little problematic. There are too many things to choose between. So you have to be careful on how you set up the choices. Um, and that's only, with an infinite number of paths, I have to be even more careful with this. Or what do I really mean? I have to have a probability distribution of your choosing in, from a continuous set of options. Um, but I guess that can be solved if you're careful with your choices. Um, the second thing is that I can, I can do the, I can, we can extend it to those kind of things, assuming this limit, the absolutely no regret, con very small players, or, I mean infinitesimally small players that is using continuous maths. If I want to take the finite limit, that is I want to take a little bit of regret and a little bit of this, then somehow the number of paths comes in, in the analysis, so it hurts my epsilon, which then I guess it, I can't take it to infinity. So as long as I don't have error bands, I just say everything is uh, absolute, no regret period, not very small regret, and infinitesimally small players, uh, then yes. Otherwise, there are issues. So the question, yes? Yeah, yeah. So th this is a great question, and let me actually rephrase the question in a more nasty tone towards myself than your tone was. 
uh, you point out that I cheated in a sort of painful way. I used examples where computing Nash equilibria actually are easy, except for the rock, paper, scissor game. Uh, it turns out that, find that despite that my whole theorem about Imagining the theorem that finding Nash equilibrium game is problematic. It's not actually problematic in a traffic route, traffic routing game. As I gave you, I gave you a very uh, convex optimization style optimality Nash condition, which is like the gradient condition. And in fact, one can use that to use standard optimization to find the minimum. Or if you want, it's a potential function, but it's another argument, sort of analogously the same argument. Um, it's a nice example on pictures. Not all our theorems are about uh, uh, games. And in fact, uh, there is a, 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 in that particular, like if I take everything I said literally, that is I take this infinite limit, infinitely small players, and only the traffic routing game, it turns out there's only correlated equilibrium that are just the optimum. I didn't define a bigger set. So what's really happening here, and I guess that's why I called it cheating, is that there is a general theorem of what applies to what can one prove. This is an example, and maybe definitely not the most convincing example, because it has this property that the optimum can be found, players can find it pretty easily, and learning actually converges to it. Uh, but it's a very nice example to use on a slide, so I kept with that. Uh, but the theorem is more general, and I guess for something that's my work, it applies to item auctions, which is not like that. It's not, it's not like individual item auctions is not a game like that. It wasn't easiest to define game for a general audience, but you're completely right. The example is, is, has some special features, and I guess the point is that I didn't take advantage of them, so it's much more broadly applicable. Yes. For which we know that the complexity is polynomial. Yes. But for Nash equilibrium in general, can uh, it be true? Or, uh, so, so actually, you're asking two, like I was talking about two different things, and the answer is you're sort of conveniently asking about the good part. Uh, one is this learning trick. That if everyone learns, they get to correlated equilibria. That's a general theorem. It, it's true in every game. No matter what the game is, uh, correlated equilibria, if you find, find the exact solution with no epsilons, no error bands, you have to use that Papa Dimitriou thing, which is ellipsoid method based. But you're OK with an epsilon error, uh, and you're OK in running time depending on epsilon inverse. Then you just get people to learn, and they will converge to the right solution. And that's general and applies in every game, absolutely every game. Uh, second, and that's a separate issue, I was talking about how much the, the welfare deteriorates. And there we have seen that in some games, the tragedy of the common, Nash equilibria are bad, and in fact, learning outcomes are similarly bad. Nash equilibria, uh, tragedy of the commons is also a potential game, also with the, pro with the issue that learning will converge to unique Nash solution, which we know is horrible. And I can't, do, I can't make it go away, it's bad. But some class of games, and I guess the ones I listed here are on the bottom slide are examples of this, but often the conditions are not sitting, not sitting, or have conditions like bandwidth sharing, I need this concavity, uh, item action, I need some form of uh, no complements. Uh, under these conditions, these are not potential games, the correlated equilibria are not the same as equilibria, and yet we can have welfare proper, good welfare properties. But that's limited to a class of games, it doesn't apply in general. Does that answers? Yeah. If I may, so I was wondering if we have some uh, idea of the convergence rate. Uh, if we use these epsilons, it's very convenient way to use these epsilons uh, so as to guarantee some of the steel convergence. Or is it in general? So there, there are many natural theorems. Here it will not starting to differ which learning algorithm they use. And the one I showed you with this exponential uh, multiplicative weight that actually is one of the winners. Yeah, that converges fast. Uh, other ones that are com more commonly used in econ community converge slower. But yes, there are convergence rates for this. OK, I think s I, I'm happy to answer many more questions, but I know many of you have to go home, so maybe we should take questions offline. I don't know, Cedric, you agree with that? I 
I think so, except if okay. there is somebody with a very uh, urgent question, then of course feel free to uh, come and uh, profit by uh, Eva's presence here. This is the first time that Eva is in uh, this institute, so that I'm very proud. Uh, Thank and, you. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, great that uh, this will profit to many uh, young people around here. Thank you very much again. Thank you.